Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Yulia Panfil. I'm the director of the Future of Land and Housing program at New America, and will be one of the two programs that you'll be hearing from today. Uh, 2020, as we all know, was a bit of a disaster, but we are tentatively rounding the corner of the COVID pandemic. Vaccines are rolling out, and there's hope that 2021 will be a year of recovery, both from the standpoint of health and also from the standpoint of beating back the virus um, and from the standpoint of economic recovery and helping to stabilize the tens of millions of Americans who are currently struggling to pay their rent and pay their bills. But how do we make sure that the recovery reaches those who most need it? That question will be the focus of today's panel. We will look at the US economic recovery through two lenses today, rent relief and unemployment insurance. We're focusing on these measures for three different reasons. First, housing and unemployment are major pain points for our country. We know, according to the Census Bureau's weekly household pulse survey, that at any given moment, between a quarter and a third of America's renters and homeowners are saying that they're behind on their rent and mortgage payments and are worried that they'll be evicted and foreclosed upon. And we currently have 17 million Americans filing for unemployment claims. Second, there's hope on the way. Congress passed a stimulus package in December that included rent and unemployment relief and is poised to pass a second much larger relief package in the coming month or so. That relief package will contain another $25 billion in rent relief and also $400 per week uh, in an unemployment benefit boost. And third, we saw that in 2020, neither rent nor unemployment assistance rollout went particularly well. In the last six months, New America's Future of Land and Housing Program and New America's New Practice Lab released reports examining the delivery challenges of getting rent and unemployment relief to the millions of Americans who need it most. You'll hear more about these reports in just a bit, and then from a group of panelists who are seeing the implementation and delivery challenges up close and personal, and are reflecting deeply on what we can change moving forward to get this much needed relief to the American people. To start off today's conversation, I'm thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker, Tara McGinnis. Tara is one of the founders of New America's New Practice Lab, a research and design lab focused on family economic security. She's the co-author of an upcoming book, Power to the Public, The Promise of Public Interest Technology. Her work lies at the intersection of policy creation, implementation, and citizen and community voices. Tara has recently returned to New America after six months of helping run domestic policy for the Biden-Harris transition, where she focused intently on strategies to support effective policy delivery. Thank you so much for being with us, Tara, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Yulia, and thank you, our panelists and all who are joining in today. Um, my name is Tara McGinnis, and I just could not be more grateful to join this remarkable group. As Yulia mentioned, I lead uh, something called the New Practice Lab in America. You'll hear in a bit from Monet and others about the lab's work um, during a presentation on unemployment short shortly. But just to explain, the Practice Lab is really an experiment housed inside a big think tank aimed at pushing the field of fields of philanthropy, policymakers, and governments to think about the people at the center of policy and to understand um, what their lives are like, what their needs are, and to build policy with, not for, the communities we aim to serve. We do this primarily through three core approaches, data, design, and delivery. What does that mean? We use user-centered design, or for those of you who are community organizers and advocates, uh, this, is, this is an old science of really sitting with people, digging in with those who are impacted by a policy to understand their needs, challenges, and aspirations. We examine the delivery of policy by asking really simple questions. How does this tax policy, rental assistance, health insurance, stimulus check actually reach people? Once a law is passed, what happens? 
When does the money leave? Where does it go? Which partners deliver it? What does the form look like for this? Who does someone call if they make a mistake? And once they've applied for a benefit, how long does it take for aid to reach them? We often answer these questions through what we call sprints. These are time-fixed exploration with a team of experts, some of whom you'll hear from later today, who bring different skills, reporting, uh, interviewing, design and delivery, policy expertise, asking and focusing on answering a single question, and really searching before a solution is invented to discover whether somewhere, someone out there in another community ha already has a solution to a problem a different government or community is trying to solve. This past summer and spring, our team, in collaboration with a number of organizations, including a few of yours, ran a series of these sprints on the implementation of the CARES Act. These were aimed at rapidly understanding how the policies were actually impacting people and seeking to find how we might fix them, either through better delivery, guidance, or changes in federal policy. We did this jointly. We also um, saw an opportunity to partner with our colleagues at the Future, um, um, the Future of Land and Housing Program to conduct data analysis and qualitative research to better understand the realities of housing displacement across the US through the Sunbelt region. Our goal through the collaboration was to visualize where people were most vulnerable to housing loss and to help decision makers target CARES Act and future stimulus funds to those most vulnerable and help local organizations who are trying to distribute those funds. Throughout the process, I think we learned just how broken the system is in many ways. We ran a similar effort and a few adjacent uh, projects on unemployment insurance, interviewing dozens of people trying to apply for help our team dug into the lived experience of claimants waiting months for checks, attempting to troubleshoot issues with applications at a time when sites were crashing, call centers were overwhelmed, and when individuals weighing the cost of safety and health and work uh, about whether to go and, and do an in-person application with long lines as we saw in places like Florida. We realized that there are aspects of the system that are broken by design, others that are broken by neglect, it's not built in particular to serve some of the most vulnerable, particularly low income communities and communities of color. Black and Latinx workers face a greater challenge in receiving unemployment benefits compared to their white counterparts. White workers make up 50% of the unemployed workers in the country, but 78% of the unemployment insurance recipients, while Black and Latino workers uh, make up 40% of the unemployed workers, but less than 20% of the unemployment recipients. This core question was at the investigation that you'll hear about in a bit. Throughout the spring and summer, our aim was to rapidly learn what was working and what wasn't, and to focus on solutions that might improve these systems and benefit those who are using them. If we are successful in our work at the lab, we aren't working by ourselves. We're working in partnership with many of you. We really aim to make this rapid feedback loop between citizens and governments, normal business, not something extraordinary. I think all of us have been profoundly touched by the crises. While it didn't hit equally, it has been something um, that binds us together. But we know, and many of your life work is focused on this, that there was a crisis before the crisis, one decades in the making. The top 5% hold 67% of the wealth in the United States the largest share since the 1920s. More than one in five households have zero or negative wealth. For Black and Hispanic households, more than two times as likely uh, as white households to be among such underwater households. Since the year I was born, the incomes of the top 1% of US households have increased seven times faster than the bottom 20% of household incomes. Research shows that there are simple fixes. $3,000 of income received before a child's sixth birthday um, could in earn the child 17% more as a young adult. Yet we're not properly supporting families' earnings. Even with states passing amazing work to raise the minimum wage, in 2025, 23 million American workers are expected to work for less than $15 an hour. That's 16% of all workers. Our responses through unemployment insurance, through rental assistance, and other ways that we aid families and individuals must meet the moment. But they also must help us reckon with the structural inequities 
that COVID has truly laid bare. Making sure we pass policies that are of a sufficient size and scope is mission critical. But I'm here to tell you, as a former White House policy implementer of the Affordable Care Act, that passing legislation that's transformational is only the first step. We must relentlessly focus on truly reaching people with policies, making them accessible in real time. Let me give you one of my favorite examples. The Earned Income Tax Credit is among the most efficient and effective poverty programs in US history. But one in five people eligible don't use it. We can and must do better. This is not an impossible dream. Others have done it. At some point, like many of you, at the peak, uh, or what, what seemed like the peak in the early days of the spring, I opened the newspaper to read about uh, a government program in Berlin that paid out $1.5 billion to 150,000 self-employed workers in just two weeks. I became obsessed with this. The newspaper suggested that people who use the program found it stress-free. One designer tweeted, uh, three days waiting to be called up, then 10 minutes on a form. And after two days, the money was in my account. It seemed to me like sending a mission to the moon at the point when we were working with some of the folks on, in this video uh, on delivering unemployment insurance and seeing people have to stand in lines. It is not a faraway land. It is another member of the OECD, Germany. It's possible. In pursuing what was at stake here, I interviewed the deputy finance minister for Germany and asked him how they came to this. One, they acted very fast in getting their aid and had policy interventions that, that were sufficient and met the moment. But two, they learned from previous recessions and from their refugee crisis that it's not enough to have the policy, it needs to be accessible. When I interviewed uh, Deputy and Minister Schmidt, he said, what were we going to do? Crash our economy because we couldn't trust people? They simplified the forms. It went from 20 pages to two, and they allowed people to self-attest if they didn't have evidence to back up that they were in need. I raise this to remind us that this is not rocket scientists. It is very hard. I think we already see that implementation is a focus for the Biden administration. President Biden, when he was vice president, saw up front in his role driving to make sure the Recovery Act dollars reached communities. So he saw the distance between when the law was passed and how long it took to get shovel-ready projects in the ground. Out of the gate, the Biden-Harris administration has released an American Rescue Plan that places attention on sufficiently scaled investments to help rescue families. But it also places attention on the details about reaching people. In the very first week, the Biden administration released a number of executive orders that are focused on just what we talk about here, equitable delivery of benefits. One executive order called out that there were remaining 8 million Americans who had still not received financial assistance, which they're entitled and charged the Treasury Department with considering the changing to its delivery structures to make sure that these Americans get relief. The same executive order called for effective and equitable distribution of government assistance by establishing an interagency benefit coordination structure. Good policy is of course essential, but good policy that reaches people and makes a difference takes a different level of effort and intention. All of you have a role to play in that. The findings of the two reports you'll hear about in a moment um, demonstrate that this, there are key learnings that can be made and acted on now. For those of you who are community organizers, user-centered design is nothing new. This is about sitting with people and understanding them and lifting up what their lives are like. Most people don't think about housing policy or workforce development. They are in a web of costs and survival. I want to turn it over to Tim and Sabia to present some high-level findings from their recent report, but I want to thank all of you for joining us and giving us the intention and level of effort that it will require to truly make a difference. Over to you, Tim. Thank you very much for those opening remarks, Tara. Uh, Narmada, if you wouldn't mind uh, bringing our slide deck up on screen, please. 
Thank you. So hi, everyone. My name is Tim Robustelli. I'm a policy analyst with the Future of Land and Housing Program. And today, my colleague Spiha and I will be providing a quick overview of our uh, report on housing loss in the US Sunbelt called Displaced in the Sunbelt. Now, before we jump in, something to keep in mind as we present is that over the course of our research during the past year, we saw a confluence of three challenges that really made it harder on renters and homeowners amid the pandemic. And that comes, uh, and that involves bad data, extreme inequities in who is actually suffering from housing loss, and then the poor delivery of housing assistance as Tara and Yulia previously mentioned. When it comes to bad data, we know that one third of US counties don't have easily accessible data on evictions or mortgage foreclosures, not to mention anything of more granular details when it comes to housing loss, such as the amount of back rent owed by renters, or if tenants have legal representation in eviction court. When it comes to extreme inequities, we saw that housing loss rates vary drastically across our case study locations, uh, and that sometimes differs from block to block. One census tract might have a housing loss rate of 1%, and the neighboring census tract might have a rate of 10%. We also saw significant racial and economic disparities in who is losing their homes. But because the data isn't readily available, often policymakers aren't uh, savvy or privy to those insights and can't uh, target the communities most that need most effectively. And finally, we saw the poor delivery of housing aid. Uh, often the nonprofits tasked with dispersing this aid uh, were stretched in their capacity to do so. And we saw across many of the places where we conducted research that there were extensive documentation and means testing requirements, which often made uh, aid inaccessible to uh, the most at-risk households. Uh, next slide, please. So why did we choose to focus on the U.S. Sunbelts? Well, metro areas in the U.S. Sunbelt are experiencing significant population growth, and many cities are increasingly diverse when it comes to race and ethnicity, the age of residents, uh, socioeconomic strata, and even the types of jobs that are added to local economies. And many of these cities, Houston, for example, are often cited as indicative of what American cities as a whole will look like in the future socioeconomically. At the same time, we've seen housing in prices increase steadily over the past 20 years, um, leading to higher rent and mortgage costs. And we know from our previous research that the U.S. Sunbelt as a region experienced some of the highest rates of housing loss in the entire United States. And that's driven by states such as Arizona, Nevada, and in the Southeast, Florida, Georgia, and South Carolina. Next slide, please. So what did we do in our study? We mapped and analyzed evictions, foreclosures, and combined housing loss across seven U.S. counties for the years 2017 and 2019, so right before the outbreak of the pandemic. And our case study locations included uh, counties with large cities, some of the largest in the U.S., such as Phoenix and Maricopa County, Arizona, and Houston and Harris County, Texas, as well as some smaller cities, such as Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, North Carolina, and uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And while we pulled individual records, we visualized and analyzed at the census tract level across these case study locations, and we paired this analysis with qualitative interviews to better understand the context behind these numbers with an emphasis on the racial inequities uh, within housing and housing loss, as well as the impact of COVID-19 on housing security. And we did this because we believe that understanding where displacement was most acute and who was impacted before the pandemic can help us better predict and understand COVID-related housing loss after eviction moratoria and other protections expire. Uh, next slide, please. And to jump in a bit to our high level findings uh, before I pass it to Sabiha, uh, what you see on the left of this slide is a map of housing loss at the census tract level in Orange County, Florida, which includes the city of Orlando. Uh, this map is indicative of what you can see in the report. Uh, they're all interactive online, so I encourage you to uh, explore that. Uh, across all seven case study locations that we worked in, the average housing loss rate for 2017 and 2019 was 3.4%, meaning that around one in every 33 renters or homeowners with a mortgage were experiencing displacement during our study period. If we break that down a bit more, 
to evictions and foreclosures, the eviction rate was just over 5% and the foreclosure rate was just under 1.5%. And that indicates that uh, renters are a bit more at risk of housing loss in comparison to homeowners with a mortgage. When it comes to a top line figure, uh, roughly half a million out of the 17 million inhabitants in our case study locations lost their home each year. And housing loss rates varied considerably across our uh, locations, with it being 2.1% in Orange County, Florida, again, home to Orlando, and as high as 8.8% in Norfolk City, Virginia. And before I pass it off to Sabiha, I'll just mention that in most case study locations, evictions accounted for the majority of instances of housing loss that we saw. Uh, Sabiha, over to you. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, so my name is Sabiha Zainalbai, and I'm a senior policy analyst with the Future of Land and Housing team at New America. Um, you can go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So in addition to understanding where housing loss is occurring, we wanted to understand who is losing their home. And so to better understand this, we did a correlation analysis to test the strength of the relationship between housing loss and a host of demographic and housing variables. So we found that the demographic variables that are most commonly and positively associated with housing loss in the seven Sunbelt counties um, that we studied were um, those with a larger share of black households, um, those with a larger share of households that lacked health insurance, those with a larger share of households that relied on public transportation um, to go to work, and um, less common but still present in two counties were those with a larger share of single parent households. Um, you can go to the next slide. So the findings from the correlation analysis informed additional analyses that we did on race, um, kind of a deeper dive. So given that the share of black households in a census tract was shown to be an important factor in being able to predict where housing loss might occur, we wanted to map what that looked like. So this is um, one of the counties that we studied, Harris County, Texas, and we categorized census tracts such that they fell into one of four, cate one of four categories. Um, so we categorized them as majority black or majority non-black um, and above or below the median housing loss in the county. And then we mapped where we saw this occurring within a county. And so in the map um, on the right hand side, you can see that households that are majority black and have above median housing loss are concentrated um, both to the Northeast and to the South of downtown Houston. Um, those are all the tracks that um, are uh, a deep purple color. Um, and we can also see that in this map that nearly 95% of tracks that are majority black and have above um, median housing loss. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. We can see that um, nearly 95% of tracks are majority black and have above median housing loss. Um, you can see that there's very few tracks that are majority black and have below median housing loss. Those are the, the lighter purple color tracks. Um, and so something like this we hope would be useful, especially um, useful and related to our conversa conversation today about how to target um, rental assistance to communities that need it most. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into our qualitative findings, but we did interviews with a host of housing experts and local stakeholders in each county to better understand some of the dynamics we were seeing and specifically to discuss COVID-19's impact on housing. Um, what we saw um, was stakeholders characterized the rollout of pandemic-related housing aid as slow, uneven, and often ineffective at reaching the communities that need it the most. Uh, most counties relied on nonprofit organizations embedded in local communities to facilitate the distribution of funds, but there was significant variation in how those funds were distributed. Um, and then lastly, we heard that outreach to impacted or at-risk communities about the existence of aid is equally as important as the actual distribution of aid, as communities need to know that aid is available um, in, in order uh, to apply for it. And next slide, please. So we're, um, I think the panel discussion later is gonna dive much more deeply into proposed policy, policy solutions, but a little bit of what we heard from stakeholders across um, the Sunbelt counties um, in terms of proposed solutions to mitigate pandemic related housing loss, um, improving the disbursement of aid by simplifying the application processes and reducing barriers to access. Um, dispersing aid directly to tenants instead of landlords um, is something that was suggested would be helpful. Uh, strengthening tenant protections, of course, and slowing down the eviction process once the moratoria is lift. 
And then lastly, increasing tenant education about the availability of aid through um, robust outreach to communities um, who are most at risk. Um, so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Monet Fields-White to discuss uh, some of the findings from New America's Unemployment Insurance Report. Good morning, everyone. Yes, my name is Monet Fields-White. I'm a former, C former fellow with the New Practice Lab at New America. Um, and last year, we witnessed millions across the nation lose their jobs at the onset of the pandemic sending unemployment rates to levels not seen since the Great Depression. Still, the economic devastation has not been colorblind and neither have the financial support systems that are meant to buoy workers. In short, COVID-19 has wreaked habit, havoc in Black and Latinx communities at a disproportionate rate, both from a health and economic standpoint. Last summer, our research team, including myself, our fearless leader, Vivian Grobert, Alberta Alvarez, and Nikki Zeigner, set out to understand what Black and Brown workers experienced applying for unemployment insurance amid the health crisis. One note, I would also want, I also want to acknowledge another contributor to our final report, Cassandra Robertson, who is a current senior fellow at the New Practice Lab. From our research, we began at the foundation of the UI system. Now, UI was created as part of the New Deal um, in 1935. From its inception, the system excluded agriculture and domestic workers. 65% of those workers were African-American, compared to 27% were white. And the administrative details of implementing UI were left to the states, providing few controls for ensuring equity in the distribution and duration of these benefits when it, when it was left to the states. To quote Colin Gordon, American history professor from the University of Iowa, he said in an essay, the American system of unemployment insurance is a remnant of Jim Crow. With that statement and the foundations of UI in mind, we as a team began pulling away the layers of this system to view it in a greater context to get to a series of compounding inequities that continue to impact workers of color and low wage workers today. Next slide, please. So what did we do? In June and July 2020, our team interviewed about 25 Black and Brown workers who were laid off, furloughed, or were self-employed and lost income due to COVID-19. All interviewees had, attempt, had attempted to, were in the process of, or had already applied for unemployment benefits. We discussed with each one of their each one about their experiences going through the application process and how they were going to make ends meet when benefits didn't arrive. And all of the stories we were hearing in regards to just accessing websites, computer systems crashing, um, getting through, but then not receiving their benefits for months, by the way. We also spoke with 15 experts who cover issues related to race, our labor force and the overall economy that included organizations such as Working America and the National Employment Law Project, aka NELP, whom you will hear from later in our panel discussion. From our interviews, we found there are internal and external factors that are at play impacting the design and implementation of UI, meaning that even if we were to upgrade and fix all of the UI websites and increase staff to handle the massive volume of calls from those seeking support, there are still barriers in place and have been in place for years internally and externally that make benefits less accessible to black and brown workers. Next slide, please. Again, we found that there are internal and external factors that are at play impacting the design and implementation of UI. So what did we learn? Each section of our report dives further into those internal and external factors that influence UI and the difficulty to access 
the system among workers of color. To highlight a few, I will start with the, just the design of the system itself in that our states and our federal governments have put a clear focus on searching for fraud over accessibility. That gets to the punitive design of the system. Lawmakers also have bandied about inaccurate and harmful myths, such as claiming collecting UI leads people to not wanting to work. They had used these myths to further restrict or gut benefit programs over the years. We spoke to one of our interviewees that comes to mind who said that she'd rather be working than collecting unemployment because she has dreams and goals that she wants to achieve for her own family. Efforts to modernize systems also serves as a roadblock in basically moving strictly to online platforms. You can't do that without addressing our digital divide. Many black and brown households compared to white households lack Wi-Fi or even a computer within their home. And they rely on their mobile phones, their smartphones to access the internet. Here's one note, many state websites are not mobile friendly. Additional roadblocks in applying and access, accessing benefits can also be as simple as where you live. The South, including Mississippi, Louisiana, Georgia, South Carolina, Alabama, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Florida have less generous benefits. And also within these states and a few other states, they have very strict work search requirements. Next slide, please. As a result, black and brown workers are less likely to be helped by these systems, making it harder to overcome periods of unemployment. And we must note black, brown, and low wage workers are viewed through a narrow lens. They're trying to defraud the system that gives employers more power in deciding who receives benefits and who doesn't. So essentially, quoting Helen, um, the system is not designed for us. Helen, who has worked for more than three decades as a hairstylist in Louisville, Kentucky, excuse my Kentucky accent when pronouncing the city's name, it's within my blood, but getting back to Helen, she expressed that sentiment that the system wasn't designed for us even though she, like many, pay their taxes which support these systems. She's part of the gig economy that's not covered under the UI system, had not been covered under the UI system prior to this pandemic. And based on our research, black and brown workers make up a significant portion of that working population. Under the initial CARES Act and following legislation, they now could, can receive pandemic unemployment assistance. But the question becomes, should we look at providing that assistance at any time of unemployment, not just during a crisis? When we talked with Helen, she told us, quote, you pay your taxes, you do your thing, contributing to this economy, why not? Especially in this pandemic, which has exposed the frailties and inequities within our system that should be impossible to ignore. And honestly, we can't afford to ignore anymore. The UI system didn't break amid this pandemic. It was already broken. And while modifications and reform, while there have been, um, excuse me, and while the system has changed over time with some modifications and reforms, our research shows its foundation is inherently racist and classist, creating access barriers for workers of color and low wage workers. Fixing what's broken about UI means looking outside and within UI to first identify these various influencing and interrelated, and then begin to take them apart. Our research left us asking, who are these benefits meant to serve? If UI was designed in response to the Great Depression, what will we design in response to this current crisis? What values will we center on? We have worked through the framework that has given us the unemployment insurance system we have today. It's just the beginning. But if we don't ask these questions or root out these inequities, we will continue to perpetuate racism in the name of progress. In conclusion, these are questions and factors our government, including the new administration and Congress, need to consider and put in the forefront to truly root out systemic racism in our future policies and systems.
And now to Malcolm Glenn for the discussion portion of our presentation. Great, and thank you so much, Monet. Um, and it's great to be here with you all today for what I think is um, a really, really important discussion. Um, you've heard so much great stuff about the two reports. Uh, and so if you haven't, I really do encourage you to check out both our Displaced and the Sunbelt report, as well as the Unpacking Inequities and Unemployment Insurance report. Um, as folks have already stated today, uh, the coming months are going to be among the most consequential we've ever seen in terms of getting assistance in the hands of people who need it. And, and I think both of the reports and I suspect that the conversation we're about to have will be really helpful in sort of guiding how we think about getting that right, particularly for people from underserved communities. So my name is Malcolm Glenn, and I am fortunate enough to be a fellow for New America's Future of Land and Housing Program. Uh, I'm also the Director of Public Affairs at a company called Better.com, which is one of the leading digital first homeownership startups in the United States. Uh, and it has become, I think, a little bit uh, trite at this point to talk about how esteemed a panel is. But in this case, I think that is truly the case. Uh, I think you're about to hear from a really amazing group of folks. Uh, I'm gonna offer a brief introduction to each of our panelists, but I wanna spend most of the time hearing from them and then ultimately hearing from you. And to that point, please, please, please do submit your questions. Uh, we've gathered a couple of questions in the chat box. Please feel free to submit them to the Q&A box uh, as it is our intention at the end of the discussion to get to as many of them as possible. Okay, so on to the panelists. Um, as I mentioned, I'll give uh, just a brief introduction of each of them, um, and then I will hand it over to each of them to talk a little bit about their work and some of the solutions and challenges they found in it. Um, Maurice Jones is the CEO and president of the Local Initiative Support Corporation, which is one of the country's largest organizations supporting projects to revitalize communities and catalyze economic opportunity for residents. Rebecca Ye is a senior research analyst at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, where she works to evaluate the implementation and effectiveness of state and local emergency rental assistance programs and other housing related responses to COVID-19. James Perry is the president and CEO of the Winston-Salem Urban League, where he leads a team advocating for civil rights, employment opportunities, economic opportunities, affordable housing, health and wellness, voting rights, food security, and more. And finally, Michelle Evermore is a senior policy analyst at the National Employment Law Project, where she works with states to improve their unemployment insurance systems and public sector pensions. Her work has helped implement key protections for unemployed workers during the pandemic. So with that, I want to start the conversation. You know, we've talked so much about a lot of the challenges and a lot of the pain points in the system. Um, and I want to hear a little bit about the things that went wrong, but I also want to hear a little bit about the things that went right. So I would love to uh, start with Maurice and have him tell us a little bit more about his work. Um, and I'd love to hear um, how the work with different communities and programs has been impacted by COVID-19 and what you've seen um, when it comes to aid delivery over the last year. Well, thanks for <clears throat> having me uh, with you, uh, Malcolm, and. Uh, the uh, other members of the panel, and uh, I'm delighted to be with you all. I do have to apologize. I've got a, a hard stop at 1 o'clock p.m. my time, so I may miss the Q&A piece of this. But let me tell you what we have been seeing. Um, we've spent the last um, year now, year and, what, two months, uh, or about a year, uh, really trying to focus on um, providing um, emergency assistance to particularly uh, small businesses, not-for-profits and for-profits who have had an existential threat uh, in, uh, in over the course of the last year. And we have, um, we have seen incredible, incredible um, encouraging signs of the public sector and the private sector coming to our partnership to do this. So last year for LISC was the largest year on record for us in providing uh, this kind of uh, recovery uh, assistance, if you will. We 
put down a marker in March that we were going to raise $100 million for a COVID relief fund. Well, we ended up raising close to $300 million for it. And we, um, we put that money out in, in $5,000 and $10,000 and $20,000, $25,000 small grants to not-for-profits that are doing this work in communities uh, and small businesses that were at risk of closing their doors. The other piece of it that we have seen is uh, the need for, uh, we were providing, for example, workforce development services to residents and communities all across the country with the eye toward preparing folks for long-term living wage job careers. Well, we had to pivot that to immediate financial assistance for rent, for utilities, to help people with technical assistance to apply to pull down unemployment uh, insurance compensation. And again, we, we saw our partners pivot very nicely into doing this work. What we're seeing now is more of this work to be done this year, particularly as it relates to rental arrears and utilities. And so we are still engaged in huge financial assistance programs, both in connection with, in partnership with the public sector and the private sector. And we're also seeing the need to do more to just make sure people have access to these programs, whether it's broadband or whether it's uh, technical assistance, helping people get through application programs. I can't overstate this enough, which is making the programs available is 20% of the job to be done. 80% of the job to be done is helping people access the programs. And so that's where we are seeing our work demand grow, helping people access these opportunities to receive this relief. I'll stop and, and pause there. Thank you, Maurice. And uh, Rebecca, I saw you nodding as, as Maurice was talking about uh, access. I would love to hear a little bit about what the last year has looked like from your perch at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, specifically what has worked well and what hasn't worked so well when it comes to some of these state and local uh, emergency assistance programs. Thank you, Malcolm. Um, so just to give a super brief background, at the National Income Housing Coalition, we are tracking key characteristics of emergency rental assistance programs across the US, um, especially around program design and implementation for, uh, I guess it's nearly a year now. Um, and I, I, I was nodding at Maurice's comments because it really is true, putting an application out there is really just one small part about um, making rental assistance accessible to people. Um, and I think that that's so, so critical. Um, and I think that, you know, this past year, what we've seen is extremely low income renters were already burdened before the pandemic and the pandemic ex exacerbated the, that pre-existing housing crisis. Um, emergency rental assistance was not part of uh, the CARES Act co uh, coronavirus relief package in March of last year. But despite that, um, a number of jurisdictions and states chose to devote at least $4.5 billion in funding to rental assistance, which is far from um, what was needed to meet the need, but better than nothing. And a number of programs used the CARES Act coronavirus relief funds. And the really unique thing about that specific funding was that it was extremely flexible. Um, it's an extremely flexible funding source. And I think that we got to see a lot of creative ways that local jurisdictions used to get tenants much needed assistance. Um, a number of programs adopted self-attestation as a form of documentation. I believe that Tara mentioned that as being key to how um, Germany got their unemployment program um, to work smoothly. And that has been really, really key. Um, and we have also seen a couple of programs opt for direct to tenant rental assistance, which I think is really innovative. Um, and then kind of on the flip side, I think that a lot of jurisdictions 
did not take as much liberty with the openness of the guidelines of coronavirus relief funds. Um, you know, whether that's out of fear that those guidelines would change or because, um, because Treasury did not say expl explicitly that yes, self-attestation is okay. Um, so I think that's something that we learned is that, you know, the, the guidance that comes out really needs to proactively affirm that flexibility is allowed in, um, in the program and not just allow it by not forbidding it. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, James, I wanna to turn to you. You have a very interesting perch um, down in North Carolina, looking very much at the local context for all of these assistance programs. Would love to hear from you about how you think the last year has gone um, for the distribution of those assistance programs um, in the triad region. James, I think you're on mute. Uh, thank you very much. And, um, you know, I, I would start by um, you know, going to an important point that Rebecca made, which is that in the coronavirus uh, relief package from 2020, there, there was a decent amount of money made available to uh, uh, jurisdictions, but there was unfortunately a population uh, threshold, a cutoff. Uh, and if you were under that, that threshold, your community didn't get as much money. And so unfortunately, Winston-Salem, Forsyth County is one of those communities. And, and so when we think about this idea of deploying aid, one of the, the greatest challenges, frankly, was that, um, that the city of Winston-Salem and Forsyth County didn't have very much money to deploy, right? Uh, and so, um, and, and what it exacerbates that problem, at least when it comes to housing, um, is, is that we were already in a housing crisis. It's one of the incredible things that the New America uh, uh, report fines, and it's, but, but obviously we already knew it because we were living in it. We had an enormously high eviction rate. Uh, and so we were already in crisis and, and then the coronavirus uh, comes and, and exacerbates that crisis. So for organizations like mine, uh, you know, the challenge was great because you know, we're really hands-on. We're trying to, to help people navigate these crises, but there wasn't any money for housing or, or there was a very limited amount of money for housing. And, and as mentioned in, in, in the employment report, anytime that, that people called on their own or we tried to help them call to get unemployment uh, insurance, the lines were clogged, the, the, the websites uh, were down. And so uh, our staff was all hands on deck trying to help folks, but uh, there really wasn't very much to be done. Because if you know we couldn't get through either, uh, and the websites uh, crash for us too, and so you you end up in this very unique position where there's um, where there are these compiling disasters, right? You're you're already in a housing disaster, and then you have an employment disaster, and 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 everything that's supposed to help back you up, that's supposed to make sure that you can survive these, is failing, and um, and even the agencies like mine who are designed to help, um, there's very not very much that we can do. Uh, no matter uh, how much we invest in, in trying to assist people. Yeah, I think your your point around sort of compounding crises, uh, crises, excuse me, is is really apt. And and Michelle, you know, you have been looking for a while now at uh, unemployment insurance systems, and and a lot of these systems were set up to be ready to deal with you know a crisis situation. And be interested to hear from you about how you think they've done in the last year. How well have they done in actually doing what they were supposed to do or for how have they failed? So actually no system really was able to withstand this crisis. Even the states that process benefits the, the most quickly were not meeting timeliness uh, guidelines. And that has a lot to do with the fact that we don't pay any attention to unemployment insurance when there's not a recession. And then when there is a recession, it's too late to fix it. And so we've really got to be figuring out now and taking the energy, you know, there's so many new people organizing around unemployment insurance right now. We need to figure out how to harness that energy and bring it into the next year or you know, whenever the crisis is over. Um, we need to be looking at, so you know, um, everybody's blaming the computer systems and they're not entirely wrong, right? Some of these systems were absolutely designed to fail. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but when you think about it, you know, only 18 states have fully modernized uh, computer systems, right? So, um, and, and that, that's, I, I always put modernized in scare quotes because, you know, Florida was a modernized system and it was this lowest state to pay out benefits. Um, 
it's not just the computer, although the computer can be the problem. We know there, that, that there's these algorithms that disproportionately flag people of color for fraud, that, um, that leave people of color out of the system. They're, they're ableist. Um, it's hard for people with limited English proficiency to access them. Um, so we need to be thinking about all of those things. And then, you know, really uh, thinking about a floor because, you know, um, North Carolina, since, since um, it's, you know, well represented here, um, actually is the state with the lowest number of weeks um, now and prior to the recession. Uh, all of last year, only 12 weeks of regular UI were available. Um, as opposed to 26 weeks in most states. And they had recently cut benefits by basing benefits, not on the highest quarter of wages, but on the last two quarters. And as you all know, it's usually the last two quarters that you're working at a failing business or that you're not, uh, you're not thriving at your job. Those are maybe the two least high paid, the least highly paid quarters. Um, so, yeah, I think I, no system did well, but some systems truly, truly catastrophically failed workers. And so everything needs a boost, but we also need a floor. Yeah, and I, I, you know, when you say that, that there were so many failures, it just reminds me of the, of the quote that Monet left us with at the end of her presentation, that these systems are not uh, designed for us. And I think the us can mean different things depending on who's speaking, but I know one of the ways in which that manifests itself is through the lens of race and would be interested to hear um, about what the costs of not centering racial equity are in terms of delivery design. And then if there are, because I do wanna hopefully find some positive things that we can highlight, um, what are some examples of ways that, that localities have targeted aid to those who actually do need it based on some of these demographics? So um, Maurice, how about we start with you? Sure. Um, you know, just sort of uh, quickly on the cost of not centering. I mean, the cost of not centering is you leave people out um, and you and you have uh, a system that what happens is you leave people out. You realize that you leave people out either because they come forward in um, and make the case or uh, by some other means, you you figure out you leave them out, and then what you try to do is uh, make adjustments to the system to include folks in communities that should have been included uh, at the very beginning, and um, it's a recipe for uh, um, imperfection is the kindest way of putting it. And so, what what people need to do is to um, be much more inclusive on the front end uh, in who is in the room when, you know, when this is all happening, when the systems are being designed. So you've got more voices, so you have a chance of being more inclusive because fixing it after the fact means that people will get left out early uh, and may get left out permanently. But what you see more often than not is people getting left out early and then going back and trying to repair. And that repair is always imperfect. We saw that in the PPP program. Uh, we're seeing it in, in some of the uh, rental assistance programs. Uh, and so the real key is having a um, inclusive design upfront outreach to designing the programs at the beginning. Take the time at the beginning to put the people and the groups and the voices around the table so you can target. Uh, and the costs are tremendous. Inefficiency, um, you know, people actually suffering irreparable harm, a, a program that is flawed in many ways. And so the benefit of the targeting from the beginning with multiple voices at the table, uh, it's it's hard to over it's hard to overstate that. And let me just be real clear that um, you know what happens is people will design a system and then they'll think about black and brown and low wealth communities after the fact, right? Um, 
And, you know, I don't know how many times, uh, because if they had thought about the black and brown and the low wealth communities at the very beginning, their conception of what the system is would be much broader. Their conception of who's delivering to those communities, who you need at the table to build that system would be much broader. And that's what we're seeing repeated over and over again. I, I took much longer in answering that uh, query than I had intended, so I, I apologize. No, no worries, Maurice. And I think it's such a great point. There's a, a phrase that is prominent in the disability community, and I think it applies more broadly, which is nothing about us without us. And I think that's what you're getting at, inclusive design from the very beginning in the design of these systems. Um, James, um, from North Carolina's perspective, are there any good examples of, of ways that that folks there um, targeted aid specifically focused on racial equity to the people who needed it? Well, well yeah, um, but it, it, I think the, the frustrating part is that they, they weren't part of government systems, right? So, uh, you know, there's a, a local group, Housing Justice Now, who has done an amazing job um, raising funding and then making it available to, uh, directly to people who, who need it. Um, and, and I, but I'd, I'd also pause for a second, and I think that's, that's what you'll find all, all around, around the country is that the systems that were able to move most quickly and to really help people were community-based. Uh, and it was, there were systems where people saw a problem in their community and then decided to react, which is frustrating when you consider that we pay so much money into systems through our tax dollars that are designed to protect us and they weren't there and, and didn't act quickly enough. But, but then also to, to that earlier question about, uh, about the role of, of race here, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of Lonnie Grenier's book, The Miners Connect, Connect the, uh, the miners canary, and it, it is this idea that um, that we're all inextricably linked. That if, if you create a system that harms black folks and brown folks, eventually that system is going to harm everyone. Right? You, 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 there's no division in the way that this system will work, so that um, so that only these uh, these group groups of people who were historically maligned will be affected and harmed. One of the most interesting things I think in, in, in the New America report is when you look at those areas that are majority black areas that also have a high rate of, of, of housing loss, that um, as much as there may be no or very few um, in most communities, um, high, high you know, com communities that are both African-American and then have low rates of, of housing loss, in all those communities, there are still white communities or, or, uh, that have a high rate of, of housing loss, right? So it's not restricted just to African-Americans. It, 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 eventually, uh, the harm will infect and affect everyone. Absolutely, and Michelle would love to just get your thoughts here as well um, about the cost of not centering these delivery mechanisms around racial equity and if there are examples where that's been done well, whether it's in the community or in government. You destroy communities, really. You know, unemployment insurance is the best investment during a recession um, in terms of bang for the buck. For every dollar spent, that's a dollar sixty-one cents in the local economic activity, right? Um, now, you, you you look at a state, for example, Michigan was the first state uh, after the last recession to cut the number of weeks available of unemployment insurance, and they cut from twenty-six to twenty weeks that year. The duration of unemployment for black and Asian workers was 27 weeks, but for white workers, it was 19 weeks, uh, closer to 20 weeks really. So that has a, a direct racial impact. Um, and at the, after that, um, the state uh, modernized its computer system without any input from the community, without any user testing, and it installed this black box algorithm that flagged at least 60,000 people for fraud. That's right after the penalty for fraud um, was increased to four times the amount paid plus 12% interest. And you wonder why Flint and, De and Detroit never um, recovered from the last recession. Um, that is a huge part of the reason why. Um, and, you know, and, and like, you can turn these things around. Um, during this past year, um, the UI system was actually run by a former UI addict who ran a UI access clinic, and um, they were able to turn it around, and, and it, it became the, one of the fastest states at paying benefits. But I absolutely agree um, with the, the comments about making sure people are at the table, because, you know, every, in every instance so far of modernization that I've looked at, 
um, with the IT systems, um, they were really thinking about the back end and making it easier for the state agency. And there were never focus groups. They never, they never brought disability advocates to the table or people with limited English proficiency or people on the other side of the digital divide. And I absolutely agree that going forward, nothing should change without affected claimants at the table. Rebecca, in your looking at the effectiveness of some of these programs at the state and local level, have you seen um, any of these programs do a really good job of targeting folks based on, on race or other demographics, or are you seeing some of the same challenges the other panelists have talked about? I think that there are absolutely similar challenges. There have also been some good examples of um, a couple of key programs that I think are prioritizing racial equity in their um, in their rental assistance design. Um, so in the state of Washington, for example, um, they required in their in their statewide program that all local jurisdictions must um, partner with organizations by and for communities of color. And I think that that is one way to ensure that there is, that there are folks um, who understand what um, applicants are going through um, and how to help them access this, the um, assistance. Um, I think a couple of other um, ways that I've seen programs target um, aid to those who need it most is using some sort of prioritization system or having a referral service um, for specifically people who are, say, facing eviction, um, for renters who are Black, um, et cetera. So there are a couple of different ways, um, but I, I think that over all the, well, sorry, I, I didn't mean to end on a negative thing, but um, I think overall the one of the biggest things is making sure that the application is not um, burdensome, overly burdensome, um, so that when an applicant looks at it, they can understand it. Um, and, I, and I think that providing assistance um, to help folks get through that is really, uh, really key. I appreciate that. There have clearly been a lot of issues and, and problems with delivery in the context of a crisis, but I think one point that Monet made that was really apt was this notion that the real reforms come kind of in response to the crisis. And so maybe the, the big change that we need, unfortunately, isn't happening now, but maybe it will happen in response to the crisis that we're in today. So I would just be curious to hear from you all kind of your vision for what could happen in the aftermath of the crisis. How can we take the lessons that we've learned from COVID um, and all of its extended results uh, to make delivery systems more equitable and human-centered? Maybe Michelle, we can start with you. I think that um, there's no time like the present. I think if, if not now, it's never gonna happen. But I really think that um, we have seen the cracks in the system. We have seen the people standing in line for unemployment. Um, you know, 44 million people were able to access a benefit, a life-changing benefit. Um, but what, but one of the things that we noticed during this recession, right, is that about half of people who got a benefit got it through the pandemic unemployment assistance, which is not, un you, you have to not qualify for unemployment insurance in order to get that benefit. So we're clearly only reaching half the people that we should really reach. Um, so I think, you know, we will, we will enter the next decade with people with fresh experience with this system um, in their minds. And I've seen people organizing around this like you wouldn't believe. It's crazy how, how people have just come together, become experts in unemployment insurance overnight and have figured out how to advocate together. And that's exactly what, what we need. It, 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 unemployment insurance isn't going to get fixed because I have these ideas about how it should, should go or, or some expert has some idea about how it should go. Things get fixed when people come together and, and lift, lift up their problems, right? So my vision is that those people come together, tell us what they need and that policymakers listen and build a system that's responsive to what they want. Um, I think 
you know, some, some degree of federalization of unemployment insurance is necessary. If you look at the two, the two main um, indicators of whether an unemployment insurance system is good, it's how many people get benefits and how much those benefits are. And if you overlay, you know, the states with the lowest recipiency and the lowest replacement rate um, with population density of black workers, Latinx workers, indigenous workers, those are the states that have the worst benefits. And so um, I think we really do need to think about a much more uh, robust federal floor so that states can't get away with paying so few people so little money. James, what about you? What, what do you see as a potential opportunity about how reforms could take place in the aftermath of the crisis? Well, you, you know, I, I think um, it, the answer is somewhat inherent in your original question, and, and, and I think that Michelle uh, really answered it well when she talked about the idea that um, it would be something that's community driven, right? Um, and um, unfortunately, uh, people who make policy oftentimes tend to be people who've never uh, faced an eviction, uh, who have never had to use unemployment insurance, uh, who have, have never had to wonder about what they might have to do if they ended up homeless. Uh, and so, you know, this, this idea that the solutions should come from the community is in many ways inherent in, in what a democracy is and the way that a democracy is designed to function. And, and so the larger question for me is, is about the disconnect that prevents that from happening and, um, and, and whether or not there's room to be optimis optimistic in a way that can hope that, that it can happen, that this, is, that this pandemic could be a turning point that would allow uh, community-driven decisions around um, around people's fundamental right and opportunity to housing uh, and and around unemployment insurance. So I'm hearing a lot from from both of you about the notion of sort of um, community-first, community-centric efforts. Rebecca would be curious to hear um, if you have thoughts beyond um, community-driven efforts about what could be an opportunity that comes about as a result of the crisis. <laughs> I think that this is what I'm thinking is that the, the way that assistance and support programs work more broadly, I, I think that this whole thing is just showing that it all needs to change drastically to really actually help households. And so I, I hope that, um, that we can use this opportunity um, to change the way programs um, are asking folks for things, are um, asking for documentation, um, because it's, I, I, th I think that like the one issue we run into with emergency rental assistance is this idea that, um, you know, well, we need to make sure that people actually need help and it's just so antiquated. And, um, you know, I, I really hope that we can change that concept and myth uh, moving forward. Yeah, I, I think we're all pretty hopeful about that. Um, well, there are a bunch of questions that are coming in from, from folks in the audience, um, which I'm so appreciative of. So uh, I'm going to transition over and um, toss a couple of those out to each of you. Um, uh, I'll throw these out to the group. Um, and, and whoever is interested in, in answering and can dive in. But the first is, and this has been touched on earlier in the conversation, the digital divide, and it's from Frank Wells. Uh, and Frank says, the digital divide in accessing rental assistance programs um, has been a huge barrier for low-income renters, especially in communities of color. We'd love to hear good ideas and best practices for equity in accessing these resources. And I think the same thing applies to unemployment insurance. So I'd open it up to all of you. You know, certainly for our organization, the digital divide was the uh, most, was and, and remains the most difficult issue. You know, um, before the pandemic, we had computer labs and, you know, you could come to a computer lab at any one of our uh, locations and do anything you needed. And so, you know, it doesn't completely bridge the, the digital divide, but it helps. But so what happens in a pandemic when all of a sudden you can't let people into your building then, um, and, and when everything becomes digital, right? When um, you, each, each thing that a person would want to um, 
to have access to requires a computer. And I, I, I don't think, um, certainly in this community that we've effectively overcome th that, that issue. I, I, but but, I, uh, but in, in speaking to my colleagues who advocate around issues related to the digital divide, I, I think um, you, you know, the push is to make sure that, um, that broadband is more widely available to folks at, uh, at a more, more affordable rate. And then also to make sure that, uh, you, you, I think, to make sure that computers are more available and, 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 and again, at a more affordable rate. But, but I, I haven't seen uh, a widespread solution. As a matter of fact, I've seen the digital divide exacerbated. I think um, also, you know, with unemployment insurance uh, specifically, um, I think th there are a couple things going on. Now, I, number one, as, as states do upgrade, um, they need to make sure everything, everything is optimized for mobile, that there's mobile document up upload, but also that people are available by phone, um, particularly um, with an eye to access for people with limited English proficiency. Um, they tend to want to call in a little bit more often um, uh, than others. And so, you know, uh, having, having multiple uh, means of access is really important. The other thing is, um, so one of, the, one of the big ways that uh, people get flagged for fraud is by applying from the same IP address. Making sure that's not the local library is pretty important. Um, so making sure that when somebody, when people are coming from, a, uh, when, when there are multiple applications coming from a, an I, I, the same IP address, that it's actually truly uh, not a public computer kind of IP. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I, I would second Michelle on um, making sure things are mobile, but also um, and I, I think that one of the reports that was discussed today put it really well. T internet is just like a tool. It's not the solution. Um, it sh there should be multiple ways for people to access um, rental assistance programs and applications. So phone is huge. Um, I think mail is still huge for some more rural communities. Um, and I've heard of creative things like um, having like a, a drive-by where, uh, like a drive-through window where you have people um, tell, tell you what their um, rental assistance stuff is, bring the documents, take pictures on mobile phones, um, and then kind of get things sorted out that way. So I, I don't know. I. The, the digital divide is still a huge issue and um, keeping a number of formats um, for which applicants, through which applicants can apply is still extremely important. Yeah, and I think the digital divide is, is relevant to, um, but not entirely encompassing of um, the challenge for some people with disabilities. And we have a question from Karen Bannon and uh, it says, has there been any consideration at all about how disabled people fit into the equation? Um, Michelle, I know you've mentioned um, some of the challenges that people with disabilities face before. Maybe we'll start with you and then we can see if James and Rebecca have anything to add. Yeah, so you know, with unemployment insurance, one of the core tenants is that people must be able and available to work. So you know, you've got that word able in there right away. And we, you know, one thing that we see is, for example, if somebody quits for a medical cause, that automatically flags them. Um, so, you know, we, we participated in amicus earlier this year or last year um, about a woman who had a seizure disorder. She couldn't drive a school bus anymore, of course, um, but she, there are many, many other opportunities for somebody with a seizure disorder. And the system said, no, um, you're not able and available because you quit for this, um, because you have developed a disability. So we need to make sure, first of all, that the core system isn't as ableist as it is. And then, we just, as we develop tech, as we um, have people apply, uh, we need to make sure that uh, every single online system is meeting core uh, guide, core um, requirements for people with disabilities. And, and we have to bring people in as these systems, both the system is getting designed and as the computer system is getting designed.
great. Um, okay, next question is um, from KT Coleman. Um, and he says, this question is for James uh, or anyone, I suppose. Uh, I am a housing advocate in Winston-Salem. And from my perspective, it seems as though the biggest problem is local government dragging its feet in the distribution of funds. They've been sitting on millions of earmarked for, uh, for assistance for months while people are struggling. What do you guys think is the reason for this? My cynical view is that they don't truly understand the depth of the crisis and they'd rather give cover to themselves than give any quote, undeserving people money. Yeah, um, thank you, uh, KT. I'm, I'm also tracking that issue. I think it's $1.25 million that the city has um, in RUMA funds uh, that are designed, of course, to assist people if they are behind on their mortgage or if they, are, uh, they need rental assistance. And, uh, um, the, and, I, and I don't think it's unreasonable to be uh, cynical about, uh, about this, and I'll, I'll tell you why in a moment, but, but, I, but, but having looked into it some because of my own concerns about it, I, I think that the, the delays aren't completely unreasonable. Uh, they put out an RFP initially for that funding and, uh, and apparently they didn't get enough, uh, or, or at least it is my understanding that they didn't get enough responses um, to use the entire fund. And so they, uh, it took them a while to realize that. And then they put out a second RFP, uh, which, uh, and, and I think they've begun to make uh, award commitments um, based on that second RFP. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the challenges, so, one, so obviously one challenge was that uh, we didn't have enough people or, or nonprofit organizations to apply for the funding. And I think uh, the second issue is that you know, th there is uh, constantly this, um, um, you know, this difficult burden of having to navigate uh, federal guidelines. And I, and I think that the city um, has not found it easy to navigate and to manage those, those guidelines. And then, then I think here's, here's just, and I'm sorry to go a little long on this point, but um, Folks here are cynical about um, issues around housing. Uh, there's an incredible report uh, that came out about a year uh, a year ago by a local uh, public radio that found that probably as many as 40 or 50 percent of evictions uh, that happened in 2019 were at the hands of the housing authority. Right, our our public housing authority, the entity that is tasked with uh, helping people who are on the precipice of homelessness was in fact the entity that was causing people to be homeless. So when you look at the New America report and you see these incredibly high uh, rates of eviction, um, if you dig in a little bit deeper to see who's doing the evicting, the, 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 the organization that engaged in the most evictions was the housing authority, right? And so it, it does cause a fundamental distrust for, for government when it comes to their role in, in keeping people safe in housing. In, in this case, however, I, I, I don't think that that's, that's what's happened yet. I think what's happened is that, um, that, that this process is a government process and it has unfortunately been slow. There's a, a question from an anonymous attendee um, about fraud. And I know fraud has come up a couple of times in the conversation. Um, and the question is, have you, any of you all heard any murmurings about identity theft where people are getting benefits in others' names? I know fraud is not super prevalent and we don't want to lean into that narrative, but there were a couple people at this person's agency that had it happen to them. So they thought they would ask. Um, they never applied and one isn't even in the state. And then I'll just say someone else responded and said, actually fraud was a huge problem in Nevada and California. Police arrested individuals with dozens of benefit checks in their possession clog systems, et cetera, et cetera. So I would just be interested to hear from all of you about how prevalent, if, if at all, has fraud been in what you've seen? And if it is an issue, uh, what can be done about it? Fraud is usually a very small piece, a small portion of um, payments to, in, in unemployment systems, and we focus on it way too much. But this year there was a giant, massive, massive international fraud ring um, and, and other fraud rings that were systemically attacking state systems. So this year fraud actually is a problem and I, I kind of do worry a little bit about the prevalence of fraud uh, creating a negative tone about the system in general. Um, and so, you know, there probably do need to be things done to, to prevent this. What I'm really worried about is people who've been impersonated um, but didn't know, will get a 1099-G form or a, a government tax form that says that they owe, owe money on these benefits that they never got. And that's going to make them mad and make them not like unemployment insurance. Um, so I, I, I do think something needs to be done about the imposters 
Um, but, it, you know, in general, over the course of the last 10 years, it, we have to be really careful because the overfocus on fraud really did prevent innocent people from getting benefits. Like there was this, um, there was this strike team that did a report on California's UI system and they found that all of the flags that they had to flag people for fraud actually didn't catch a single fraudster. They just, um, you know, held up innocent people making rookie mistakes. So we've just got to be a lot, a, a lot more careful about this. There's a question from um, someone, and maybe we'll start with Rebecca, and then if it, other folks want to chime in. Um, a December report predicted that the number of affordable housing units exposed to flooding will triple over the next 30 years. So in addition to addressing housing needs now, I'm wondering if states and localities are thinking about how to build better and address environmental injustices in housing access as well. Bless you. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's a really good question, Sarah. And um, yes, absolutely. Uh, honestly, our, so I, I would say that I am not the expert in terms of talking about housing and um, addressing disasters, uh, environmental disasters. But that is something that NLIHC is working on and the disaster um, recovery housing group within the coalition is working a lot on, and I know that they've made a lot of really um, good progress these past couple of months. Um, and I, I think that the other thing that I'll mention is, that's, that's tangential, is um, there has been a lot of really great work towards addressing homelessness in the past year-ish. Um, and I think that makes me very hopeful. So a lot of, um, so the California, for example, used a good chunk of its money to invest in um, Project Home Key, I believe it's called. And um, they are using that to pretty much um, adapt hotels and motels to convert them into residencies for people who were experiencing homelessness um, and they're going to become um, permanent, permanent supportive housing systems. And that will be, the, um, people will be able to use that moving into the future since they're actually, anyways, I think that that's very exciting. I think that's a, oh, sorry, go ahead, James. So I, I, I end up, I'm actually from New Orleans. Uh, or, you know, if I were home, I'd say New Orleans. And, um, and I ran a housing organization in New Orleans, um, both the year before Hurricane Katrina and then for 10 years afterwards. Uh, and we, uh, we filed suit against uh, the federal government and the state government over their housing recovery programs. And, and, uh, and, and I, I guess one of the main things that I would note is that I haven't seen uh, local and state entities um, really addressing uh, affordable housing need related to environmental issues, but I have seen the federal government address it. And, and so what I've seen since Hurricane Katrina is, a, is a, um, there's been a constant set of, of changes to federal policy, both at, um, at, at HUD and at FEMA around housing recovery and, and about around getting people back into housing and doing so in an equitable way. It's still not perfect, uh, you know, but, but, I, but I've seen a, a constant evolution in, in the policies in order to uh, to make sure that they're better prepared and to make sure that the response is more equitable. I, I, I just wanna, um, I, I love that answer and um, we're pressed for time. So I'm gonna ask just one final question. And um, what Rebecca said about Project Home Key, I think is, is, is sort of perfect for the framing, which is, and, and the question comes from Elizabeth Garlow. Um, um, and in the short time we have left, I'd just be, I'd I want to hear from you all. Um, what are the bright spots in uh, either unemployment insurance or rental assistance from 2020 that we might learn from? Um, briefly, was there anything that came about this year that you think um, was innovative or pushed things forward or that we should keep as we go forward in a post-pandemic world. And Maurice, I saw it, I see that you jumped back on. So just- I jumped back on, thanks for briefly having if you, me. Of course, briefly, if you have any thoughts for any um, 
uh, what take was your away, question? Yeah, if you have any thoughts for any takeaways from 2020, bright spots that we can keep with us in a post-crisis world. Oh, lots of bright spots in my mind. Uh, one is this incredible uh, leaning in right now, particularly in the private sector, but I now also think with a, with a new uh, federal governmental partner in really trying to uh, do something about the racial wealth, health, and opportunity gaps in the country. It is a huge opportunity, one that we need to lean into and make sure it's more than a 2020 phenomenon. Um, and so all these entities are making these commitments to uh, fighting uh, the good fight on this, and we need to get these commitments and make them real and make them long lasting. Uh, you know, we launched something called Project 10X, which is designed to capture some of this interest. And we are asking partners to commit for 10 years to do this work. And so I would tell you that amidst the incredible pain uh, and sorrow of 2020, what has been encouraging is um, more and more, particularly in the private sector, groups have committed to doing something about the inequities we have. And the key is making those commitments real and lasting. And so um, I'm, I'm looking forward to jumping on that and, and trying to make sure it actually is something that we can take and do some real work with for the next generation. I love that. Michelle, James, Rebecca, any final thoughts on any bright spots we can take with us? Organizing. Um, you know, people have been organizing around UI like crazy, like I mentioned before. And what, I, what, what we find is when somebody learns how to flex that organizing muscle, they don't forget. And so they'll bring that organizing into the next thing in their life, into their workplace. You know, um, I just have great hopes that this is the beginning of a real cycle of organizing around our issues. And similarly, I think the, uh, the organizing effort of Black Lives Matter over the course of the spring and the summer uh, was an incredible bright spot over the, uh, relative to all the challenges that we've seen over the course of uh, certainly 2020 and the start of 2021. And, and you know, I think the, the outcome from, from that organizing um, may be, uh, at least relative to this conversation, uh, new affordable housing programs and more money. Uh, you know, no matter where folks fall on this side, on this, on the concept of defunding the police, we have seen a number of jurisdictions uh, decide that they were going to use money either from the police budget or from other budgets to increase affordable housing opportunities. And uh, that's a, a, a very welcome trend. I'm going to just piggyback on that really quickly. I think that we've seen that housing is increasingly a form of health care. It prevents people from experiencing all sorts of um, uh, all sorts of negative health outcomes, and I, I think that that's going to be really key to pushing for more housing provisions in the future. Fantastic. And on that note, I just want to say thank you to you all for joining. Uh, it's been a really exciting discussion and conversation. And uh, I will pass it on to Yulia to close us out. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Malcolm. Thank you to all of our panelists, presenters, and uh, to our fantastic audience for uh, tuning in and asking provocative, interesting questions. Uh, as we know, this is a topic that will continue to be very top of mind as we move through 2021. Uh, so I really appreciate this discussion and know that this is not the last uh, time we will be visiting these issues. Uh, thank you again to everyone and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.